Hi, this is Jerry Boyer. Welcome to Meeting of Minds. Today, we're talking with my good friend, Nick Stone Street. Nick is the CEO of Ronald Blue Trust, which is the largest Christian advisory firm in the world, or at least in the United States. I don't know if we've compared all around the world, but it is clearly the leading firm that is um, serving people from a biblical point of view. And we're going to talk today about finance and economics and a little bit about corporate engagement and proxies and what's been going on with the politicization of American companies. First of all, uh, Nick, thanks for joining us today. Jerry, it's great to be with you as always, my friend. Yeah, it, it really is. I've been looking forward to this. So, um, you know, last year we had kind of a tough time for markets. This year it's been a little bit mixed, but mostly up. Um, I, I know you've been doing a lot of thinking. I've heard you speak on panels and also on the Ronald Blue Trust podcast about kind of where you see the economy and markets uh, going and where they've been and what we're heading towards. Can you kind of give us the Nick Stone Street view of the economy and markets? Sure, Jerry. I'd be glad to. Um, you know, last year was confusing for a lot of folks uh, because it ended up with both uh, equities and fixed income being down. And that, that's rare. It's only happened a few times and it was rare that it happened. But when you think about the big picture and the backdrop of why um, so many asset classes were down at the same time, it, it, there's, it's not a difficult explanation. Um, you know, when you go from what we call the risk-free rate uh, which is what a, a treasury would pay, say a 30-day treasury would pay, uh, you know, 25 basis points. And then all of a sudden the risk-free rate is at 450 basis points in a very short period of time. Every asset class has to reprice to that risk-free rate. So if I can have, you know, basically near cash instrument at 4%, you know, four and a half percent that's risen from 25 basis points, fixed income has to reprice to that. If I'm going to attract capital for you to lend uh, to me, whether it's, you know, corporate or government fixed income, everything has to reprice. And it's the same with equities. If I can get four and a half percent just sitting on the sideline, then, you know, uh, with, uh, with the equity markets, they all had to reprice to that risk-free rate too. So did real estate, by the way. Mm. So you're seeing every, pretty much every asset class have to reprice to the risk-free rate. So there's no mystery around what happened. There's um, a unusual aspect because it happened so quickly. We've just never seen these kind of rate rises that fast. Probably, you know, in 93, we saw seven Fed hikes of 25 basis points each over, I don't know, you probably have a better historian on that than I am over a couple of years, maybe a year. No, within, I think within a year, but we, but there was still, um, this was even more traumatic uh, than that. And the magnitude of the hikes, you know, you kept getting 75 basis points at a time. And even as we've just seen in the last uh, week or so, another 25 basis points. And so this uh, willingness to fight inflation uh, at all costs and continue to raise the rates keeps causing assets to reprice. Now, the majority of the damage that can be done got done uh, last year, but that's that's essentially what happened hmm. uh, as we look at the year in review. Now, that sounds almost like like some kind of arcane or advanced analysis. But in fact, this is the fundamental equation of all finance, which is right. that an investment is worth the future cash flow Correct. discounted by an interest rate. Um, right. And it's it's almost like um, it got forgotten. It's not like it's some, we didn't learn something new last year. We relearned something that people forgot during, you know, basically from 2008 up until last year, uh, you know, tremendous amount of interest rate suppression, and they got to essentially forget the fundamental truth of of yeah. financial valuation, which is that interest rates matter. Yeah, I totally I agree with that. Um, it's funny because a lot of what we talk about with private investors at Ronald Blue Trust are, you know, we talk to them about volatility, how much something bounces up and down is, 
you, you, which is kind of the, the standard measure of risk in our industry. Um, it's called standard deviation. And people look at how much an asset class bounces up and down as the measure of risk. And in fact, in very short periods of time, like in one year, two years, how much something goes up and down is is a, a reasonable measure of risk. Volatility is a reasonable measure because of risk. Because you might be forced to sell when it's down, basically. Correct. Right. Correct. And as you go longer term, the further your time horizon is, if you've got a 10-year time horizon, volatility is almost irrelevant. What really matters then is inflation. And so if we've talked to our clients over the last five or six years and said, you know, in the short term, your risk is volatility. We can accept that. But in the long term, for longer term capital allocations, it's inflation. And clients would say, what's inflation? <laughs> They'd forgotten well, about it. No, right? <laughs> the people have been reminded. And it's and inflation is always more stubborn than uh, people think. And that's something we've been on the bandwagon about from very early time uh, during this, uh, from early last year, saying, look, as inflation moves, it's it tends to persist. And so understand that this isn't just uh, transitory. We never believe that. And we never believed that it was just going to go away um, magically in a short period of time. Yeah, it's almost as though I know you're not into market timing and I'm not into market no. timing, but um, it's almost as if the moment when the last person uh, who was who was going to remember forgets, <laughs> you know, the possibility of stagflation or the um, uh, that that bubbles can't go on forever, and that the old rules of valuation haven't been thrown out, and that from now on top line revenue growth is the only thing that matters, and that Fang stocks can go up forever. Uh, that that is that is almost the exact moment. <laughs> When the, when the strategy of momentum or the strategy of ignoring inflation is no longer effective. When the lesson is forgotten, that's when the lesson is most important for investors to be reminded. And if your advisor doesn't remind you, reality will remind you, will reteach. Yeah. And, you know, we, we've employed a lot of these fundamental kind of analysis, which that, you know, that you mentioned, Jerry, around uh, discounted cash flows. And we think in those terms, and honestly, when the FANG stocks were running away and you had basically, you know, 11 stocks in the S&P 500 crushing every asset class in the world, basically, um, you know, you know, it can't go on forever, but it can go on longer than you would expect. And as long as that was going on and a very narrow segment of the S&P 500 was outperforming everything else, you know, people tend to doubt uh, kind of those princi the principles that we talk about and the wisdom behind the principles we talk about. So, you know, the, the folly can go on for, it can persist longer than you think, um, but eventually the fundamentals uh, return. And that's what we've seen happen uh, with, with that sector of the S&P. You mentioned principles. Uh, so Ronald Blue Trust uses a, a principle-based investment framework. Um, sure. And um, I, I think particularly we're just kind of alluding to the principle of inherent value, that something that something has an, has an inherent value, um, but that that can become distorted, but it can't be distorted forever. Yeah. And I think this was right. I mean, last year was a really interesting time um, for the cryptocurrencies. And... Um, it, the the decision we made in the house is we're not going to just uh, throw cold water all over uh, blockchain and blockchain technologies. We think they're interesting. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time diving in and studying them and understanding how different companies could play out and how cryptos could play out in someone's portfolio. We just elected not to include them in any of our allocations. If clients wanted them, we were not trying to be overly parenthetical, we did allow clients um, to have both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, no other cryptos, because we just thought there's this, just kind of this smorgasbord of uh, lunacy. And, yeah. and so the ones that we thought would be around are the ones that are still around. And at a client's direction, we would add crypto uh, to their portfolio, but there was no house allocation because 
frankly, we wanted to watch and understand the asset class for a little while longer. And we thought there was a lot of hot air in it. And, and, you know, with investing, it's always humbling. And, it and, you know, that turned out to um, be a, a correct view in the short term. A lot of the ridiculous um, valueless cryptos have gotten um, decimated and some of the ones that may have a little bit more merit behind them, the two that I mentioned, are still here and have had, you know, a little bit of a recovery. But that's that's kind of the thing is, is you're looking at, um, the, you know, an asset class that you're, most of which we thought would be value less, and it turned out to be accurate. But, but you know, while you're, while you're waiting it out, and while you're examining it and having honest conversations about the the viability of the asset class you know you have bitcoin going to you know 60,000 and people thinking oh everybody's missed the boat well hmm. some boats will miss and it's okay we might miss that one and maybe you know it could have gone the other way and we've been completely wrong and and bitcoin could be up to you know 500,000 a, a coin that's not the way it went um and even if it did go up we wouldn't change kind of our thesis around it and, and how we interacted with that asset class for our portfolios. Hmm. It's interesting. You, as you say, you, you did not decide to throw cold water on it. I, right. My sense is that in general, um, the Christian subculture, the evangelical Christian culture, um, did tend to throw water on it. Hmm. Um, so... I mean, it seems to me like you were a little different in being open to it, um, not immediately dismissing it and, you know, kind of permitting clients to have it in the portfolio. So why? Why are you, why are you different than um, a lot of other people who share our faith? Well, I think as we like peeled back behind it, Jerry, um, we were um, fascinated and curious which I think we should be around um, blockchain technology and trusted transactions. And, you know, as a believer, if you've ever sent money overseas, if you've used a fund transfer service um, and you've seen the kind of fees that get charged and you're supporting a ministry in Uganda and you get the currency exchange fee and then you get the, the transfer fee, you know, you're losing you know, anywhere between three and 8% of what you're trying to get to a ministry, just in exchange and transfer fees. Yeah. So like the whole technology behind um, blockchain and trusted transactions and the validity of ownership, there's the aspects of blockchain technology that, that we find fascinating. It's just not fascinating enough to put into portfolios in a definable way where we look at cash flows and how we would get paid back for committing our capital. But it doesn't mean that we're going to be dismissive of innovation. We have to look at innovation. You know, uh, you One know, of your principles is the principle of human blockchain productivity. For a reason. So, right. That's the principle of human productivity. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a reason that that's available now. And, and we can think about productive ways that it can be used. And we find companies that are using it in a productive and profitable way. Right. We would want to own those companies. Nothing wrong with that. Right, right. I, I found that I found cryptocurrencies useful as an indicator of public sentiment in the sense that they're very complex. It's really hard to understand how right. they work and what the right. proposition is behind them. The right. math is a little complicated and, the, and it's just, it's not intuitive. Um, now, maybe there's a generational difference. Well, okay, I'm on the wrong side of that generational difference. So it's not intuitive for me and probably for most people with assets. And yet, people were so concerned about the world of paper, about the possibility of inflation, about debt levels, that they mm -hmm. were willing. It, it's almost like there's this great big room. They're all having this dance, you know, in this great auditorium. And is it safe here, you know, or is it not safe? And somebody says, I smell a little smoke. And somebody else says, no, no, there isn't. And then at some point, a bunch of people head for an exit door. And they don't quite know where that exit door leads. 
But if a whole bunch of people are heading for the exit door to a door that they don't really understand, that tells me something about what they think about the main auditorium. So it was kind right. of an indicator early on of a lack of confidence in the soundness of the dollar. And in some sense, it was, a, it was an, an accurate anticipation, given the fact that we had once in a generation levels of inflation, something that, as you pointed out before, people had forgotten about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, people are always looking for uh, certainty, right? And that's another one of the principles that we talk about, which is the principle of uncertainty. Look, we live in an uncertain world uh, and and people that want to exchange, uh, you know, certainty for uncertainty. A lot of times people will even give up their rights to have perceived stability, right? Yes. This is like, this is what we see in a lot of countries right now. You see people willing to give up their rights for perceived stability. You'll see people um, give up return on their capital over the long term for perceived security. And so as people um, would fly into either uh, Bitcoin or into gold and, and commodities, their people are looking for stability. But, you know, just like with gold, you're investing in an asset class that doesn't really give you uh, any return. You're just you're buying it as a store of value and you're hoping that that store of value increases over time or holds it va its value while other uh, um, stores of value like the U.S. dollar uh, decline. Right. right so right. so it, it really is. A, there's this human instinct of a flight to safety. And I think for the most part, um, I like people to be able to sleep at night. And so if they have a portion of their assets allocated to these flight of safe to safety items like like gold and uh, commodities and um, uh, collectibles to some extent, we've seen those markets, are, they can be really rocky uh, or uh, cryptocurrencies. I'm, I'm glad for them to have those allocations, but we really think longer term mm. investors investing in productive companies and harvesting the reward of human productivity in those productive companies is going to be a better bet. But with it comes a good bit of uncertainty. That's a good point. Something like gold is a zero sum game. You can only make right. money on it by somebody selling it for less than it's worth. Whereas, yeah. you know, stocks have earnings. Right. Um, and pay dividends and bonds um, of companies. Those companies have underlying earnings and then they pay an interest rate based on that. So you don't have to gain at somebody else's expense. Um, right. And uh, I mean, gold is almost more like insurance uh, than it is something like a traditional investment. Um, and I suppose uh, for a lot of people, uh, Christians, maybe even especially, fear gets to be very high. And when fear gets to be very high, you know, there's a conversation very focused on gold. You know, I right. see that a lot in advertising on talk radio, et cetera. Sure. Um, gold, 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 as opposed to gold as a portion, which is a hedge against the rest of, you know, against the, everything else in paper. Um, it's a little bit like life insurance. Um, you don't want to collect. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it might be wise yeah, to buy it, but uh, it's not some, It's not your investment strategy. No, and, you know, I... But we're really, you know, one of the things that we talk about here, Jerry, is the the best portfolio for a client is the one they can stay in long term. Mm. And if having some allocation to gold helps them have a secure feeling about the portfolio and they can stay in their strategy for the long term, then we're fine uh, with having that allocation and understanding where that investor's proclivities are. Because the worst thing that you usually see with with investors is when they hop around, and um, you know, there's literally people that have not gotten back into the market since 2008 and still are waiting for the right time, and you know, the market's completely run away from them. So it's it's understanding where that investor is and helping them stay in long term. Uh, that's the right portfolio. Yeah, some strategies are better than others if you look historically, but there's no strategy as bad as abandoning your strategy when it becomes emotionally difficult. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And unfortunately, and a lot of people do it. They do. It's human nature. Um, and that's why, you know, you want to you want to build in um, kind of that uh, for bubbles and crashes so that you can, you, you really want to help people kind of inoculize 
their portfolios from bubbles and crashes. And that's why we go in and use those time-based portfolios. So I know, you know, my, my cash on hand is very safe. My one to three year money is relatively, you know, safe. My three to nine year money is pretty secure, even though last year that's mostly fixed income and it did take a hit. And then my 10 year and longer money, I can ride out the fluctuations of the market. And when people see their money bucketed in that way, it kind of lowers their anxiety. Mm. You know, when anxiety is high, learning is low. Mm. And so when you can lower an investor's anxiety by having them know, look, I've got 10, the stock market just took away 20%. You know, my, the, the market could crash 20% but that's my 10 year plus money. I've got a long time to recover. I know my short and intermediate term is fine. Then the anxiety goes down and they can learn from the situation rather than react to it. And this speaks to the idea that the the financial industry and academia focused on volatility, mono focused on volatility, yeah. when yeah. in fact, that's largely a discussion about stocks, right? Um, right. When it since it's only a short term risk factor, then someone with wise portfolio planning shouldn't care because they shouldn't have short term money in equities. Um, so it's like you, you you can ride the roller coaster of volatility. You're in it, but instead, if you're looking out ten years from now, you're looking at a roller coaster ten years, uh, ten miles away. Yeah, it's going right. up. It's going down. What does that matter to me? I'm, right. I'm I'm not on it now. I'm not going to sell it. I'm not going to be forced to sell at the bottom. But right. people do find it difficult not to live in the emotional life of a quarterly piece of paper, a report that actually has no impact on their standard of living or their plans. Um, right. Uh, it's difficult to kind of get out of that headspace. And I suppose that's the point of an advisor. Um, and one of your advisors, Kevin Clock, likes to say to me, look, he said, my main job is to keep people following the strategy. My main job is a life coach. Yes, there's value add with the particulars of the strategy, but the main thing is to stop them from doing something foolish because emotions are jer are jerking them around. Yeah, and and you know, and some of the things, some of the some of the mistakes that you see that kind of that bucketed approach helps prevent worse than equities, you know, as far as people losing money in in volatile equity times is illiquidity. And so if you know, if you want an example of illiquidity, look at the pawn shop. You know, it's having to sell when you have to sell, not when the market's right. And so we really, and sometimes clients feel like, you know, especially when they're earning almost zero on cash. Now those times have changed a little bit. And so earning, you know, three, four percent on cash feels a lot better than almost nothing. But but earning almost nothing on cash caused people to lose some discipline and would say, you know, I just want to put my money to work somewhere. Well, if you have cash on hand, that money is working for you. That cash on hand, even though now with inflation, you you still need to have liquidity. Um, illiquidity will destroy more wealth faster than any market volatility will. And it seems counterintuitive for people, but we've seen it over and over and over again. And that's why we start with that first bucket of making sure you have sufficient liquidity. So if things do get hard, you don't have to uh, sell into it. Cash is optionality and optionality is important. And if you have a deflationary recession, a credit crunch type recession, cash is how you're not forced to sell your house at a huge right. loss, for example. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, you mentioned something earlier I want to loop back to that typically uh, stocks and bonds move in the opposite direction, right? That people are risk averse. They take their money out of stocks and they put it into bonds. If they're feeling if they're feeling lucky, you know, if they they take they'll buy the lottery, you know, they'll 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 take the right. variable. For, you know, I don't I, yes, I can get my two percent, but I think I'll do better if I take a chance and they move over. Um, so I kind of think of it, you know, there's a yield curve. It's like a seesaw. Like if you put, if you put stocks on the yield curve along with bonds, I'd put them out here, you know, on the they're like infinite infinite future, so they're out here past the thirty year bond, and the yield curve can do this as we move back and forth. Um, uh, now some people are hearing this in audio and not seeing the video. Sorry, but imagine a teeter totter, and then you have right. it. 
But when stocks and bonds both sell off, that is almost always due to the same thing, which is the central bank is removing liquidity from markets in general. So as they're, as they're essentially that, that giant pump that was pumping trillions into the system, they put that pump in reverse and they suck trillions out of the system. Then that's not all coming out of bonds or it's not all coming out of stocks. It's coming out of markets in general, and therefore they both fall. Yeah. And that's the machine that we saw go into motion last year. And that's why both stocks and bonds and every asset class had to reprice. Um, and, you know, you had this consistent rise and then the rest of the world has to start to keep up, right? Because we were really uh, first on uh, raising rates and we probably rose this, you know, the steepest of uh, most major economies. And you start to see finally Japan would crack and start to move a little bit and Europeans would start to move a little bit. But, you know, we were just leading the way. We were just throwing the hammer down that we're going to stop inflation. And yeah, it is. It, it, it was those breaks came on really hard. So here's another basic finance truth, which is that capital moves to where it gets the highest yield. So if we're raising interest rates, that sucks money from overseas, right? People want U.S. bonds because we're paying a positive interest. So that creates a demand for our treasury bonds. But if you're a foreigner, before you buy a treasury bond, you have to buy dollars, right? You buy dollars and then you use those to buy treasury bonds. So that creates a demand for dollar, which means there's a very strong correlation when, when interest rates go up in one country, but not another, um, with developed countries. Like if, if interest rates go up in Turkey or Russia, that's probably crazy risk. But with the yeah. big with the big boys, right? The Europe, the you know, the Japan, the United States, um, that when there's a shift in interest rates upward, that strengthens the currency, it creates an excess demand for that currency. And is that is that not indeed what we've seen as we've been raising rates? Well, yeah. And you know, frankly, the currency markets are the most efficient markets in the world. So you're always looking at that interest parity between currencies, and there are traders all over the world looking for discrepancies between, you know, the minute an interest rate moves, that discrepancy is, it's um, caught up to immediately. You know, this is why uh, currencies are traded out to four decimal places. And you see huge sums of money moving immediately to keep that parity. There, there's arbitrageurs that are working around the clock making the currency markets the most efficient markets uh, really in the world. They are, and yeah, currency so, markets are the world's largest market. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and they're super efficient. I mean, trading to four decimals and moving so quickly. So when the dollar is paying more interest, it becomes the dollar becomes more valuable. Right. And then you'll see um, the euro sink versus the dollar because the dollars become more valuable because now it's paying more. Now, we've been in a dollar bull cycle for a long time. And, um, you know, I think that's something that's going to come into question, you know, in the in the coming years. We can talk more about that if you want. Yeah, I, I do want to just make a quick observation, maybe a little bit more on the technical side. I like to look every week at what's going on with the Fed funds futures. Like every week, there's sort of a story of the week. Like recently, you know, job market, jo- jobs created were bigger than expected, right? Um, right? And essentially what's happening is the market is evaluating news on a minute by minute basis. And then right. the market is trying to guess what the Fed is going to do. Because when the Fed is $10 trillion, it's the biggest investor in the world. Um, there's no single investor who's close. And so what's fascinating to me is the pattern is overwhelming. When we have a week that's a hawkish week, right, or as opposed to a dovish, if we have a week where there's bad news, therefore the Fed's probably going to not raise rates as much. You know, it's more dovish when that happens. Right. Gold goes up and the dollar goes down every right. time. Right. So, th- I mean, this really, these really, pe- people tend to think of markets as highly irrational. My view is that they're generally rationally and efficiently responding to maybe irrational and um, 
to some degree, unstable government policy. We're, we're all trying to guess what the Fed's going to do. Um, right. And because we because we don't know what they're going to do, because they're a little unstable, then investors have to be responding to that all the time. Yeah, you know, one thing I would say about this Fed, though, is um, usually you do kind of guess what, have to guess a little bit what the Fed's going to do. But if it was pretty much the guidance that was coming through for most of the year last year was kind of like 75 base points, 75 base points. And then this last one was, you know, 25 base points is pretty much they this is the most obvious Fed that I've ever seen. Like <laughs> they they were clear, like this is going one way and we ain't stopping. And if you couldn't read those tea leaves, um it you know, shame on you because this was they were they were clear about what they were going to do. And maybe after the fifth or sixth time they did it, you actually started to believe them. Yeah, it's almost like what was so surprising, <laughs> what shocked everybody is that they kept their word. I yeah. mean, that was the, the, the unstable thing was for once they I mean, my my bingo card was not seven hikes in a row. I didn't have that. I didn't think they had the guts for seven, whether it's a good policy or not, we can debate about that. But whatever it is, it's a tough policy to implement. And I huh. didn't think they'd have the guts to do seven hikes in a row. Um, yeah, there's hard medicine um, that's come with that. And, uh, you know, I think there's still forecasts for a uh, recession. And, uh, you know, I felt like last year we were in recession for part of the year. And I think Technically, the statistics proved proved that out. Um, well, they did, and so we had this hard. I mean, Q, we had this Q one and Q two were negative. Yeah, they were. So they the, were. Technical the technical definition, definition of a recession is two quarters Absolutely. in a row of negative economic growth. That's what Investopedia says. That's what Wikipedia says. That's right. what the dictionary says. And by the way, that's what the federal law says. You know, when you have these, um, you know, when you had these deficit reduction, Graham Hawley, you know, deficit reduction right. plans. What they said is you have to limit deficits except during a recession. And in the federal code, they wrote in, you can tell this is like an old beef of mine. In the federal <laughs> code, they wrote in what is the legal definition of a recession? Two quarters in a row of negative economic growth. Okay, that's what we got in the first half of 2022. We had a recession. The question now is, are we going to have another? Well, and I think, you know, this is where uh, I'm not sure that the Fed's done yet. If you would ask me three months ago, I would have said, yeah, this next in February, they'll do another quarter, the 50 base points in a quarter, and then we'll it'll slow it down. Um, and maybe they they'll let it go for a while. But um the other side of that, Jerry, is inflation's much more stubborn and rifles through the economy in a way that um, people don't necessarily expect. And so you go from uh, you know, these shocks like the oil shock we were having because of the uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine um, to, uh, you know, you start to get these shocks. But then as uh, inflation, higher prices settle in, you know, we also had all the supply chain disruption, uh, being able to get goods and start, get goods, especially uh, from uh, COVID shutdowns, especially it, it showed our vulnerability around China, uh, yeah. you know, reliance on China and for goods from China. So you start to get that. And then it kind of took a turn. Uh, inflation's taken a turn towards, okay, now what are you going to do about wages? Because inflation's up 8% this year, and you're going to give your employee their 3% raise. Um, you're going to lose people. And we're still in a tight labor market. Yes. So this has been a real tightrope because once you start with the the uh, wage, you you know, the price wage spiral, unwinding that part of the recession story is hard. And then the other thing that I think will be a contributing factor going forward to um, Buffett against sort of lower inflation is the China's reopening. They finally decided, you know, COVID didn't matter. And when they're at the absolute peak uh, COVID in their country, they decide to put people on airplanes and send them all over the world again, which is great. Um, and as China comes back online, you'll start to see the resource competition right. uh, go at it again. And China's reopening is going to keep inflation higher for longer. And I've seen a lot of forecasts that says, you know, 
this is just coming down and kind of a straight line. Yeah, we're not really there with that yet. We're not there that we're going to be at, you know, two and a half percent in the next year. And I've seen a lot of big houses forecasting that and, and we just we just don't see it. Yeah, that wouldn't be. I could tell you my, you know, our own internal Boyer Research forecast is something about four and a half percent over the next five years. Um, wow. Now, that doesn't mean it won't go down. And, and right. we thought it would, right? And we thought it would go up right. and run up to 10 percent. And then it came down to what? Five percent. So are, is, is inflation beaten? Is five percent inflation a victory? You know, by what standard do we? Now, I understand month over month, it's down a little bit. But this kind of goes together a little bit with the recession picture, because when you have a contraction, you tend to have short term decreases in prices. People are scared they stop buying. But that's right. not really beating inflation. That's just a, essentially kind of an interruption um, right. in their purchasing. Um, just like we saw prices go down a lot during the worst of the COVID shutdowns. That's not really deflation. That's just people aren't buying at the moment. Um, and so if we really are in a contractionary moment, I think we probably are, or it's close to zero. And by the way, how much difference does it matter if your growth rate is 0.1 versus point or negative 0.1, right? I mean, yeah. one is recessionary and the other isn't, but yeah. you don't feel the difference. Uh, it's it's slowing down. And I think, you know, Jerry, we're going to continue to see uh, you know, these hikes just put the brakes on a lot of the housing market. So if you think of the average person in the United States that was going to buy a house and the mortgage rate was 3%, and then um, because of all the prices running up and the difficulty to get goods for new construction, et cetera, we just saw uh, home prices increase, you know, 30%, 40% in some markets. And so if you look at the a 30, 40% increase in home price are coming back now some, yeah. but then you're looking at people buy as much house as they can get for the payment many times, which is not, you know, always good counsel. And so if you look at a 3% interest rate, which is what we had, you know, 14, 15 months ago to a 6% interest rate, you know, your net house is now 30%, say it was 40, now it's back down. It's 30% more expensive than it was two and a half years ago. And your mortgage payment is now double what it was. Right. Uh, and so you've got to buy a more expensive house with a much higher mortgage. And so people's housing costs have, you know, the shock in the housing market is still coming home to roost. And I think we'll continue to see housing under some pressure going forward. And it's hard to, you know, think about what does that mean for a young couple, their 20s or early 30s, that, you know, that's how you start basically building your wealth is it starts with your home. But they're going to rent until they're in their 30s or, or yeah. longer um, because yeah. there are no starter homes left. And that's not just an economic thing, not having a sense of ownership, not having a sense of stability. That's a... That's a big thing. Um, hey, yeah. mind if we switch over? We've talked about yeah. you know, the finance and economics. Um, what I hear from people a lot, people who are in markets, investors, um, is that they become very concerned about BlackRock, about the politicization of America's boardrooms, about um, ESG, or at least some versions of ESG investing. Um, and um, I know that's something that you're hearing a lot about, and you've done a lot of thinking about. I also hear a lot of discussion from Christians about, am I allowed to invest in the XYZ company because they, uh, you know, they have a gay pride day or, you know, this cable company, people can buy pornography from the cable company. And so there's a, just a lot of, I think, moral discussion and maybe even some confusion about how Christians relate morally to their portfolio. Um, I just like to you kind of get your view on on those. I mean, that's a big topic. So just jump in whatever part you no, feel like jumping into. No, you know, we really want to encourage biblical wisdom around uh, finance. And, you know, where we usually start with people is with their spending. And, um, you know, Ron Blue, the person, RBP, you know, many years ago, just talked about spend less than you make, avoid the use of excessive debt and be generous. And so as we look at kind of the building blocks for our clients, we want them to be great stewards of all God's given them. And we want them to kind of draw 
the finish line. How much is enough for me and how much for others? We want them to be generous. So these are the fundamental kind of biblical principles that are behind uh, sound biblical financial planning. Um, and it's, you know, kind of what we've done here for over 40 years. Now, um, this idea of clean and unclean as it comes to equities, um, should I buy this stock? Should I not buy that stock? You know, we've seen people that have had uh, opinions about that. And I'm certainly glad to have those discussions. The one thing that we don't really do is have those opinions pushed on our clients. So we're not really interested in people that say, look, you know, my fund is less sinful than your fund. So if you buy my fund, you will be less sinful. Um, however, with Christian conscience, if someone does feel like a company that um, I've invested in has just gone too far, I can't go down the road with them anymore, and that's your conscience on that company, I don't want you to own that in your portfolio. So um, we've created a way for clients to have uh, access to the kind of securities they want. If there's things that genuinely bother them, uh, you know, if they had uh, someone in their family that was addicted to gambling and they don't want to own DraftKings, that's fine that they don't own DraftKings. The only thing is, I don't want someone else telling our client, you shouldn't own DraftKings or you're in sin. I want clients to come to their own convictions about what they should and shouldn't own. But beyond that, Jerry, the bigger issue that we've seen is uh, uh, around people using our clients' ownership of equities uh, by harvesting their proxy votes and um, using that to try to, to implement social change. This is the part that's been most disturbing for us. Explain what that means, harvesting their proxy votes. Uh, that's something you're in the industry, I'm in the industry. For people who are outside of the industry, I find most of them don't even know they have a vote. That, yeah, so, so a vote has been taken from them, a vote that they didn't even know existed. Right. And so this is exactly what the issue has been and why, uh, you know, companies like BlackRock have been able to get away with this. And it isn't just BlackRock. There's several of them doing it. So name the big ones and they're involved of uh, uh, anytime you own a share of stock, you own the right to vote proxy on that stock. Different things come up in the company, whether it's electing the board of directors or different policy decisions within the company. And as a, as a shareholder, you have a vote. Um, well, most of us don't, we, we, we mostly have bifurcated our ownership of a stock and the vote because there's big proxy services that do the voting for you. Because, you know, honestly, if you own a hundred different stocks, your mailbox would be stuffed with proxies and you'd be marking them up and sending them like all the time. So we've we've kind of given it over that voice to proxy services. Well, proxy services have, uh, you know, been in my view, somewhat complicit in this as well. And the big asset managers like a uh, BlackRock have been able to take all of our clients and, and many other clients voice because they, they're not gonna mark every proxy that comes in the mail. Um, they're gonna use to let a proxy service vote for them. And, uh, and, the, and the manager actually goes and, and can use uh, the voices of people who invest in their funds. It's not their money. It's just money invested in their funds. They, BlackRock's the largest asset manager in the world. They've got tons of money invested in their funds and they can take all of those votes, bundle them up and go into corporate boardrooms and say, hey, we want you to put this policy in place. What's your policy around climate change? You need to start doing this. And so we've seen some very extreme examples of this, of, um, you know, I think most of us would agree in a lot of senses with the E of the ESG environment. We want clean water, we want clean air. But this is way beyond that. This is forcing uh, companies into even unsustainable positions that are counter to their business 
Uh, like oil and, companies getting out of the oil business. Like like putting on directors in oil companies that believe the oil company should be out of the oil business. So like this is a direct assault on capitalism. Mm -hmm. And and we think that the companies are there that we invest in, that they need to be shareholder centric. This is a fundamental bedrock of capitalism. This bedrock of capitalism has lifted uh, billions of people out of poverty. So now we're trying to make it uh, these companies be uh, agents of social change, which is not the mandate of the company. Hmm. Interesting. And by the way, I should say this is something that we work on together. Um, we do work on it. Um, and I think you know, one example that really pops to mind is, you know, let's say you're a Christian and you've saved up and you have money in your portfolio and you invest it in a fund and they go, you know, they use a proxy service and at the because the proxy service makes a recommendation at the annual meeting, they vote for a resolution which pressures the company to divest from pro-life states. And that's not a theoretical example. That has been happening for, th this is the third right. year that we've seen that happening. It's going to happen a lot this year. There'll Correct. be a lot of proposals like that. So Christians are, they, their money is being used to vote to, you know, urge the company to, you know, punish North Carolina or Texas or Georgia because of a heartbeat bill. And, the, and they, right. and the, and the people whose money it is, they don't even know that was done because the companies aren't out there right. bragging. By the way, we've been pushing pro-abortion you know, policies in your name. It's it's kind of secret. Right. So what's so what's the solution to that? How do you deal with that problem? Well, the first thing is um, the way that we've arranged. We've got a solution called access portfolios where you own the individual shares. It's not just in somebody's fund. And because you've owned the individual shares, we created a proxy policy that is more of a principles based proxy policy. And um, our one of our providers that works with us for those portfolios, um, Vident Financial, can uh, has that proxy policy, and the votes will go according to um, shareholder centrism and some of the other things that that we would think would be important. Um, and and a lot of conservative voices are ignored in many places, but but especially in the corporate boardrooms as corporations are being bullied uh, by our voices being stolen and used against things that we would actually consider to be quite reasonable. Hmm. So the first step is to own your own shares and have a proxy policy overlay that supports uh, more conservative values. So the first thing, when you own your own shares, you get your vote back. Correct. But if you get your vote back, and let's say you have 100 shares, and that's 100 annual meetings, and that's a hundred proxy statements, and I've read a lot of them. They tend to be eighty to a hundred pages long. Yeah, that is unworkable. For, Absolutely. I mean, it, that that would be your new retirement job is just reading proxy right. statements. So you're saying, in addition to what you help people get their vote back, and then you help them align their vote with their values. And this this is really different from the screening approach because the screening approach says I'm going to align my investment with my values, and what that right. really means is I'm not going to invest in something. That doesn't right. align with my values. So you're not right. really aligning anything as opposed to I'm going to invest in something and then I'm going to use my voice to attempt to align what I've invested in with my values. So it's not a retreat from engagement. It's not a complaint at a distance no. about these corporations. It's actually trying to influence these corporations in the right direction. Yeah. Absolutely. We want to influence them. And then, Jerry, with, with your firm, obviously, we work with you. Um, because we want to engage with uh, firms as well. We want to have dialogue. Um, you know, I'd be very glad. In fact, I've reached out. I'd love to have lunch with uh, Larry Fink and uh, BlackRock. Um, I'd love to engage. I'd love to have conversations. I'd love to have dialogue. And um, I think we should with, you know, all of these major companies. And Jerry, you know this because of our working together. When we talk to these CEOs or CFOs at times, they're like, you know, thank goodness there's somebody on the other side of the argument, because all I hear from are, you know, these people that want to take uh, these this social issue in a certain way. And that's the only drumbeat that they're hearing in the corporate boardroom. And yet when we're approaching companies or our clients technically approaching companies using Boyer Research, for example, we're able to engage and have a different dialogue um, because 
you know, again, you can't have a hundred different companies that you're attending their shareholder meetings, but by having you, Jerry, and the service that you all provide, going to those meetings and raising a uh, voice for our clients, we we love this and we think it's given them back their voice. And you know, as Christians, there's you know, there's a time for all things, right? In the in the scriptures, it teaches us there's a time for all things. And there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain, mm. right? So there is a time to refrain, I think, from certain companies, according to your conscience, if you feel it's not right. right. But there's also a time to embrace and go in and have dialogue. And I would, I really, most of the time, there's very few companies I would just scrub out of my portfolio, but there are a few, to be quite honest. Um but but I would rather have this engagement and have dialogue and be present at the table. One of the things I was uh, reading about in the last couple of weeks, I've been obsessing a bit about it, as you know, when I start to do a deep dive on a scripture. You know, after Jesus went to feed the 4,000 and was in the Decapolis there and took his uh, Jewish disciples to where there were non-Jews, and uh, people who are unclean. And here he is taking them into the Decapolis. You know, right after that, the next place Jesus took his disciples, it was kind of like saying, oh, if you didn't like the Decapolis. Why do you um, go to Syrophoenicia? What, let's, go, let's go right up to um, Caesarea Philippi. I see, yes. And where the, you know, let's take a day and a half, two day walk and go to Caesarea Philippi where there's pan worship, yep. where there's Caesar worship too. Everything, everything disgusting that you could imagine. And Jesus is there um, saying, look, this is a world we're not, we don't jump in and we don't participate in these things. But this, you know, there's a discussion about on this rock, I'll build my church. And we know that, you know, the Catholic view would be it's Peter and that the, the Protestant view would be it's on the confession that you're the Christ, the Son, and the living God. But he was standing there at a place called the gates of hell. Yes. And that, you know, if we're going to have zero engagement, then how are we going to reach people? Right? Right. That are at the gates of hell. Right. And I, I would so, point out. So for me, engagement right. becomes an expression of our faith that we can go into corporate boardrooms, that we can love people that we disagree with, and that we can have dialogue and influence in those settings. Yeah, they're, you know, the corporate boardrooms are not the gates of hell. Christ took his disciples to far worse place, places Absolutely. Than, Absolutely. Than, than, than our clients are sending us. Because yeah, frankly, Grammys when you start talking to these companies, turns out there's Christians there and there's people that maybe make Christians or conservatives. And there's a lot of, where have you been? We've been waiting for you, you know, going on. Absolutely. Hmm. I, I was just joking around. I said, maybe the Grammys are the gates of hell based on the most recent um, <laughs> yes. production. So. <laughs> well, maybe it, it reminds <laughs> me, maybe people need to, people own Pfizer, maybe need to talk to Pfizer about some of their branding decisions. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, no. But this is right. This is right. There needs to be like uh, CBS who promoted, you know, let's all worship uh, and Pfizer who's promoting, you know, there is a there is a discussion that needs to be had with the companies and what they're promoting. Um, and that's engagement. That's not I'm never going to buy another Pfizer product, although it wouldn't hurt my feelings if I never did buy another Pfizer product or own their stock. But I would rather get into a dialogue and let them hear from, uh, you know, half of the country that they're offending. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm working, I'm, I'm him, working on I my email to investor relations of Pfizer because I have <laughs> been in dialogue with them in the past about, have you? about embryonic stem cells, for example. You know, what is your policy? We're not accusing. We're not right. just believing everything we hear in the conservative press or whatever, but we want to know. It's an ethical issue. We want to know what your position, precisely what it is. And also, you know, did you know that there was going to be something that looked like a satanic ritual? And then right after, there's, as owners, we're shareholders, there's our logo right after that. 
Is there right. anybody in your chain of command who is sensitive to what that means to 210 million Christians in America who right. are your customers and many right. shareholders? And, and here's a company that, you know, hopefully they're developing amazing drugs that are going to help people survive cancer. Like Pfizer can do so much good in the world. Is that really what you want your brand associated with? And it's a fair question, but it's a question that if you don't engage, you can't ask. So this is an important point that I think was a good one to end on, which is this is not an attack on companies. No. This is no. salt and light. It's not condemnation. This, if, if you're invested, if you have in your portfolio a company, it means you think it's a good company to have in your portfolio. It means that there's something, productivity or quality of earnings or attractive valuation. There's something about it. There's something about the principle of human productivity that's a good thing. The problem is when they veer away from that good thing right. to the bad thing that isn't really about their core business anyway. So you're right. trying to speak up to them and, and get them back to their best self, to their true Absolutely. quality. Absolutely. Hmm. And, and, you know, there are so many remarkable companies that are doing things that, you know, we're, we're grateful for products and services that we use and enjoy and, and help us. I mean, we, we want to be participants with those companies in a way that it does bring a view um, to help them kind of correct and stay, you know, please in, invent the next cancer drug. Please don't shove culture down my throat that I don't agree with. So let's let's stick to what you're really good at. Hmm. Stick to your day. And make money for your shareholders. How about that? What, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I talked over you. And make money for your shareholders. How about that? How about that? Because you yeah. know that's the law. That's the fiduciary responsibility. That's the moral obligation. Um, yeah. And people can talk about stakeholder capitalism, but if you're a CEO. And you say, well, here, you know, used to be you owed allegiance to the good of your shareholders, but right. now they're kind of down here and you've got shareholders and you've got unions and you've got the community and you've got polar bears and you have planet Earth and you have activists. They're all kind of on the same plane. That might seem like a CEO is broadening out their responsibility, but what they're really doing is they're putting themselves completely in charge because at any given time, they're the ones deciding which stakeholder to be responsive to. So in essence, it moves power from the shareholder to the manager. It doesn't move power from the shareholder to other stakeholders. It right. moves power from all stakeholders to the management themselves. Right. Hmm. Right. And that's something we want to see reversed. All right. Nick Stone Street from Ronald Blue Trust. Anything else that uh, you want to mention today? Anything we didn't cover that uh, you uh, would have liked me to ask about or anything you want to end on? No, you know, Jerry, I'm glad that we've been on this journey together. I'm glad that we've been able to work on access portfolios and the thought behind the principles that guide the investment philosophy at Ronald Blue Trust has served us and our clients well. And um you know, I'm just grateful for our friendship and this association. Grateful for you as well and for the, the firm, which has been the leader in so many areas. And I think you're really, you're leading, you're leading again. Um, there's so, so much Christian rancor about you have to screen out this thing. You have to screen out beer. No, no, you have to screen out tobacco. No, you have to screen out this. You have to, and then there's argument and there's monetizing the religious guilt as opposed to, listen, we don't need to fight about it. Follow right. your own conscience. We're not going to tell you if or what to screen out. It's such a peaceable, arenic. It's not taking sides in an old no. debate. It transcends the debate. It ends the debate. It, yeah. it, it puts it, it puts people's conscience, Holy Spirit, you know, inspired conscience back in charge because it's their money. Therefore, it's their responsibility. And taking back the vote from the aggregators and putting it back in the hands of people. I mean, Absolutely. this is really innovative stuff, and I'm not sure. Great. I'm not, you know, you really deserve credit for what you're doing there. Well, it, you know, the scriptures teach us to avoid foolish arguments, hmm. and I think that we end up sometimes, you know, with these conversations about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, and we end up in foolish arguments. Some arguments are worth having, some are not, um, but but really having Christian conscience um, served with the ability to adjust their portfolios, take out what's objectionable, lean into what you really like, 
and regain your voice and even engage in the corporate boardroom is a, a powerful um, kind of activity that's time has come. So thanks for helping facilitate that, Jerry. Nicholas Stone Street from Ronald Blue Trust. Thanks for being our guest on Meeting of Minds. Thanks, Jerry. Cheers.